Well, thank you for your presence here. Uh, my name is Pedro Enrique Lima Donacimento. I work for UNHCR. Um, and I've been a moon enthusiastic since high school. So I, this is why I would like to share a little bit of my experience with you. So, okay. so welcome to my presentation on refugees from MUN to UNHCR. So how it all started. Uh, I was in high school when a friend of mine invited for a uh, local MUN. Uh, if you cannot find me in this photo, I am here. That was back in 2009. Um, I was not quite sure how the conference was going to happen, but I really liked discussing global issues. I was really active in my classes. Uh, especially geography and history classes. So I found that this would be fun. So I joined the Model United Nations for High School Students, CINUS, organized by the University of Brasilia. Um, as this was my first MUN, I was afraid of participating and engaging. So I, just, I asked to be assigned a small country just in case I did not wish to speak. I could just remain quiet and appreciate the debate. So I chose to represent Chad at the Social Humanitarian and Cultural Committee. Now my mistake was not looking at the topic beforehand because the topic was refugees in Sub-Saharan Africa, more specifically children refugees in Sub-Saharan Africa. So when I, um, when I looked into our study guide, there was a whole entire session about Sudanese children in Chad. And that's when I, when I noticed that I actually had to speak for this thing. And I actually had to do research. I was really nervous. I can, uh, I can say that I actually had, I had some problem finding information, especially finding information in Portuguese about Sudanese refugees in Chad. Uh, most of my references were the BBC in English or Wikipedia in English. I know that nowadays the, the challenges for, for MUN students are different. Nowadays you have an abundance of information and you have to find what exactly is true. Now, but back in 2009, my problem was where to find information. So I over-researched about the topic at hand, but I did not research a lot about the United Nations and the third committee and UNHCR. And I, uh, at that point, I, I lacked information about legal uh, uh, background for refugees. And that's part of my presentation today. Um, also, this opened a lot of opportunities for me as a, as a student, both in high school and university. One of them is to be able to write study guides uh, in when I was uh, organizing anyone in universities. Um, so for example, this is very unique to Brazil as far as I know. We publish our study guides as, as, as uh, academic articles and we publish them in a series of books. So in 2014, I was Secretary General for the America's Model United Nations, in, in the, organized by the University of Brasilia in Brazil for, um, for tertiary education for university students. And I uh, published one of, the, of one of those books. You can see my name there uh, as one of the organizers. So this, this is just to give an example of how many uh, uh, doors this, this participation on these kinds of events uh, helped me in the future. So this, I selected some pictures from this last 10 years. Uh, these are from Brazil, Canada, Costa Rica, Bolivia. You see here, I, I had the opportunity to meet heads of state, like the then president of Bolivia, Evo Morales. I had the opportunity to meet the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Antonio Patriota of Brazil. Uh, I met UN organizers from all over Brazil, from Canada. Uh, I met with, uh, with uh, UN officials like Rodrigo Araujo from the UNODC in Brazil. And I had the opportunity 
to, uh, to go to Vienna, meet other EMUN organizers, and that's when I first heard about One Impact. And how is it going? Now I'm working at UNHCR in Boa Vista, Brazil. It's a, it, it's a city in, north, uh, in the northern part of the country. It's the closest city to Venezuela. But I, but I arrived at this scene in 2019 working at the border in Pacaraima in 2019. So you see that from 10 years, I had no idea what refugees were to then I was receiving refugees uh, at the border, giving lectures about their rights as, uh, as refugees and how to seek for asylum in Brazil. I was given this multiple information sessions every day during the year of 2019 for about 500 or more people every day. Uh, I was also reg registering refugees into the UNHCR data system. Since March this year, I moved to, to Boa Vista because that was, the one, was when the border closed due to COVID-19 prevention measures. And since the flow in the border stopped, I moved to the, to the nearest city to work with the population that is already here. So I currently work with registration, documentation, and I give support to domestic, domestic resettlement programs and cash-based intervention programs. So here's the geography of northern Brazil, just to give you a perspective of where I am. You see Parcarayama is really at the border with the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. Boa Vista is close to the border. It's a, about a three hour car ride. Uh, the biggest city uh, that is closer, closer to the border is Manaus, but it's very far. It's a 12 hour uh, bus drive and it's, it's, uh, the, the path is permeated by forest. So it's not a very easy path. So many refugees find them stuck in Boa Vista without any uh, possibilities to reunite with family or with friends that are elsewhere in Brazil without our help. So this is some photos I selected from the last two years. You see, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the border with the Brazilian and the Venezuelan flag, which is the exact point of the border. Uh, we, because of Procedures we have to do with uh, adults, with documentation, and you can see here I'm, I'm registering one of our refugees in our data system, collecting his biometric data. This takes time, so we, we like to give children space for them to draw, and one of the, the things they, they draw a lot is the, the exact point of the border with the Brazilian and the Venezuelan flags. This is recurrent. So that's a very, you see that's a very transformative moment for children, a moment that they reach safety. This, at the, this, this flag that is on the, on the upper side is the flag of our operation. It's called Operation Welcome in English, uh, which, is the, which is the Brazilian government operation to receive uh, Venezuelan refugees and migrants. Uh, in conjunction with UNHCR and OIM, which is the International Organization for Migration. So let's talk about uh, refugees. Let's talk about the information I didn't have back in 2009. So who are refugees? According to the UNHCR, uh, sorry, according to the Convention of Ref about Refugees uh, from 1951, uh, it's any person who, owing to well-founded fear of persecution for reasons of, reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, is outside of his country of nationality and is unable or owing to such fear is unwilling to avail itself, uh, himself or herself of the protection of that country. Uh, this is a convention, therefore it's legally binding. Uh, most countries most UN member states have adhered to this uh, refugee uh, convention. Initially, it was only about World War II refugees. The 1967 protocol has amended it to expand it beyond time and geography so that it encompasses all over the world without an exact date of expiry. And 
it, it also says the right of non refoulement which is a French word which means the right to not be returned to the country in which he fears persecution. So this is the, the classical definition of a refugee. In, the, in Brazilian law, this is exactly how it is written in the Refugee Convention. But there is also one regional uh, document of, on refugees, which is the 1984 Cartagena Declaration on Refugees. This is a declaration, so it's not legally binding, and it's only for Latin America. There are other regional um, documents in Africa and in Europe, uh, but I will focus here on Latin America because this is the, my area of work. So there's a regional Latin American instrument in which countries from this region have declared their willingness to adopt similar legislation to this in their national domestic legislation. But it's not legally binding. It means that they have to pass domestic laws first for, for it to be valid in their countries. So the, the, the declaration says that the definition of refugees now includes people who have fled their country because their life, safety, or freedom have been threatened by a massive violation of human rights. That, that means that the person may not be feeling persecution for his expressed personal opinions, but the situation of the country might be so chaotic that it may have reasonable fears to going back, even if there is no personal persecution. So this was codified in Brazilian law in 1997, law 9574, that says that every individual, individual who is forced to leave his or her country of nationality to seek refuge in another country due to acute and generalized human rights violations will be recognized as refugees. To understand uh, Brazilian law in respect to Venezuelans, it's really important to understand what this means, acute and generalized human rights violations. And my place of work, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. The office was established in 1950, so it's prior to the convention, by the UN General Assembly. Since it is established by the UN General Assembly, every UN member state recognizes its competence in refugee issues, even if they were, if they, even if they enter the, the United Nations after, uh, even if they do not have signed the UN Refugee Convention, they still recognize UNHCR as, uh, as the competent organization to deal with refugee issues. UNHCR provides critical emergency assistance to displaced populations. These are not only talking about refugees, but I'm also talking about uh, massive displacements of migrants, internal displacement, displaced people, and stateless persons. The current High Commissioner is Filippo Grandi from Italy. You can see here, uh, I met him last year when he visited Brazil, and here he is with the uh, UNHCR team, uh, the UNHCR Pacaraima team. Some data on refugees today. So uh, this photo here is me talking with uh, one of uh, one Venezuelan refugee who was living in a, uh, in a spontaneous occupation in Boa Vista. It was basically an abandoned building. Uh, and this has been one problem with, Venezuela, with uh, refugees as a whole, but in Venezuela in particular in the Latin American region. So there are currently 29.6 million people who are outside of their country of origin in refugee-like situations. What do I mean by refugee-like? I mean that they might actually they might not actually have applied for asylum, but they are in a situation of displacement that are similar to the, those of refugees. Of those, 4.2 million are asylum seekers. They have formally requested asylum. They are waiting a decision. And two thirds of refugees around the world are only from five countries. Afghanistan, Myanmar, Syria, South Sudan, and Venezuela. 
50% of all refugees worldwide are children. And all, from all of those, 85% live in the global south. So most of them choose, choose, choose or, or are forced to remain in nearby countries. Uh, so think of that next, next time you, you hear about the refugee crisis in, in the borders of the United States or, or Europe. In fact, countries, other countries in Latin America, Africa, and Asia are receiving way more, way more refugees than, than the developed world in the global north. Let's talk about Venezuelans in particular. So there are about 5.4.5, sorry, 4.5 million Venezuelans who have left their country by the end of last year. It's the biggest exodus in the history of the region, the history of Latin America. And it's one of the biggest, as I have already said, one of the biggest in the world. For the last three years, 900,000 have asked for refugee status and the others have obtained some other, other legal permanent permissions. Many countries in Latin America before the crisis allowed for Venezuelans to, to uh, receive permanent or provisional residence. And some Venezuelans have chose for one reason or the other to seek for this path for, for uh, legal permanence in their countries. In Brazil, uh, Brazil has adopted the Cartagena Declaration for Venezuelan refugees. So if you are a Venezuelan seeking refugee in Brazil, you may be granted asylum status, not because of being personally persecution uh, by some state or non-state actor in Venezuela, but in, in Venezuela, but because the situation of the country is considered in Brazil an acute and generalized human rights violation. 1254 Venezuelans have requested asylum in Brazil, and of those, over 54,000 have already been granted asylum. Of all the refugees that are in, in Brazil, 95% of them are Venezuelans. So this is from, uh, most of them have requested asylum in the last three years. So in the last few years, you have a very significant change in the profile of uh, refugees in Brazil. An additional uh, 148,000 Venezuelans have requested temporary residency, which is another legal path they can choose, and some have chosen for one reason or the other. And what is UNHCR doing in Brazil currently? We are providing assistance to forcefully displaced populations, most of them Venezuelans, and this includes help with documentation and registration, sheltering if they, are, if they have very specific needs, and have nowhere to stay, uh, they can be allocated to one of our 11 shelters. Uh, on those shelters, we deliver non-food items, such as mattresses, uh, clothing, etc. Most of the food items are, are distributed by the Brazilian army. We deliver donations in case we receive donations uh, to the shelters. For those who are outside of the shelters but might have some problems make ends meet, we can help with cash-based interventions. But we can also, and this is very important, work with durable solutions. When we try to uh, have them stand in their own feet by uh, helping them find work or helping them doing uh, courses that might help them finding work or transferring them from Boa Vista to another city where they have family or friends that can help them uh, better integrate in economically and socially to the new city where they are going. Livelihoods, which is mostly uh, courses, professional courses, Portuguese courses. Remember that Brazil speaks Portuguese, not Spanish. Um, uh, Interiorization, which is the resettlement program to other parts in Brazil, either by family, friends, uh, work uh, offer, or for another shelter. And information about campaign, uh, information campaigns about their rights, about COVID-19, and the COVID-19 hospital, campaign hospital that was set here in Boa Vista 
and many have seen themselves affected. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please follow me on, on social media. I have left here some of my personal information for you to contact me. And I have also suggested some, uh, some pages to follow. UNHCR pages, which is refugees in Instagram and on Twitter. Operation Welcome has Op Acolhida, and UNHCR Brazil has ACNU Brazil, and the, the Amon Brazil, where I was Secretary General, is also present in those medias. Um, UNHCR is also present on TikTok, if anyone uses or prefers this, this medium of communication. So I see we have some comments. So if anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat. I see I see I, I, I did it really fast because I was afraid that it was a lot of information and I was going to uh, take a while on this, but I actually made it very, very fast. I, it, I'll start out with just one quick question and I'll let our moderators turn this over. And we have unmuted people's mics. So if you get called on, you can uh, ask your question directly to Pedro. Um, but my question is, what is the best way for students to work in partnership with the UN? Like if I'm a supporter of the UN and I want to, to help the UN do its job, what can I do as an individual to make that happen? That's an excellent question. I actually started working with refugees when I started doing translations for free for them. So back, back in Brasilia, my hometown, we were receiving some refugees that were allocated from Bella Vista to, to Brasilia by Operation Welcome um, with a shelter for shelter type of interiorization, which means that they were sheltered in Boa Vista and they had registered themselves to be sheltered somewhere else. And they received support from a shelter in Brasilia and the, the operation moved them from one city to the other. But they had just arrived in the city and they did, didn't know a lot. They, didn't speak Portuguese at all. Most of them only speak Spanish. And they were starting to look for jobs because this, we're always talking, we're always trying to achieve durable solutions. So the, the idea is that they won't need shelters in the future. And they were looking for jobs so that they can, they can sustain themselves in their new city. But all their CVs were in Spanish. So I volunteered with a local NGO to help them translate their, their CVs from Spanish to Portuguese. So if you know a second language, that's an excellent way you can, you can help them. Um, if, you, if you partner with, if you can contact with your local UN office uh, to see if they can, if, they, if you can help them in some other way, feel free to do so. Do, uh, and, for example, the MUN I was, uh, I was first uh, registered, which was seen as in 2009, was partnered with, partnering with UNHCR back then. So that's the, the whole reason I joined UNHCR today is because I heard about them back when I was in high school. And that was possible because they partnered themselves with a, a model UN that actually uh, handed out, for example, uh, Geneva uh, conventions for the students. So that was my, fir my first uh, contact uh, with, with the organization. Again, this is a great opportunity to ask. Oh, go ahead, um, Clara. Sorry? Uh, do you uh, the the have a question from somebody? I think they're still on the interpreter channel. Yeah, you're still on the interpreter side, so you need to, yeah. Thank you. 
I think I think she's just she's waiting. She's waiting for a question. Do we have a question in the in the chat that we can maybe call on someone? What are some things did experience while working for refugees as a UNHCR agent? Wow. Well, um, to work on on refugees uh, issues, you have to be very prepared with uh, what you can hear from them. For example, uh, most many times I had to feel, help them fill their asylum seeking forms. And one of the questions in their asylum seeking forms is, uh, what happened in your country that, um, that made you leave? Why are you requesting asylum somewhere else? And sometimes they, uh, they have a general idea, but they can't, it's, it looks simple if we are trying to, to, to work with refugee issues and you already know this back information on refugee law. But once you talk to them, you notice that sometimes they don't, they don't know that this law exists. Sometimes they, well, most of the time they don't know this law exists. Most of the times uh, they don't, they can't name exactly what human rights were violated uh, on their experience. And at each time you meet a different refugee, it's a different story. Uh, you cannot, you cannot believe that because they are all Venezuelans, they will all have the same story. So we will have stories of domestic violence, sometimes have uh, uh, stories about uh, abuse, uh, rape. Uh, sometimes you, you hear stories of torture, famine. Uh, you have to be prepared to, to listen to the stories and understand them and help them uh, rebuild their lives in their new countries. And that's, and that's the most important thing here. Uh, to 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 help them reach durable solutions, reach uh, uh, a new life in their new country. And it's beautiful when you see when they have rebuilt their lives in some other way, even if they are not practicing the same profession they used to do in their former country, but they are providing for their families. And that's uh, and that's beautiful to see. So next okay, question. So Thank you, Anwar, from Bangladesh, for your for your question. Sorry. No, can I continue? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Next question is from Amaya from Sri Lanka. How do you suggest to tackle with the political influence when dealing with SDGs and how to tackle transparency in the funding system? Not SDGs, refugees. <laughs> okay. Good question. Thank you very much, Amaya, for your question. Very important, humanitarian work is non-political, okay? I'm here working for Venezuelan refugees in Brazil. The political situation between the two countries is tense, but it's very important that I'm not doing this from one politician or the other. I'm doing this for the refugees I, uh, I uh, serve. So I know that, for example, in my personal social media, I might have very strong political opinions. I wouldn't join UNHCR and I wouldn't care for, for refugee issues if I, I was not strongly committed for human rights, for example. But I cannot express my political opinions because I, uh, publicly, that is, because I do not want them to be associated with the organization. The organization is non-political. Our work is non-political. Uh, transparency is also a very fundamental, fundamental issue. I would not be able to talk about a lot about transparency because it has more to do with administration, but there are ver various ways in which I work with transparency and anti-bribe, anti-corruption measures. And one of the hardest ones to, to do is when they feel so uh, thankful for our job that they want to give us gifts. And I, I have to tell them, I, I'm sorry, but I cannot accept this because of our anti-corruption, anti-bribe policy. I'm wearing right now uh, one collar that was given uh, by, for me by a, a refugee indigenous Venezuelan. It was an indigenous chief 
and they, the chiefs of the Warao, uh, the Warao people group, um, uses this kind of color, and they made one that looks like the UNHCR logo, and they wanted to present us to us as a gift to recognize the importance of what we were doing. So I told them, I really, really cannot accept this as a gift, but I will buy it. So that's what I did. I actually bought this as one uh, uh, one thing I have to remember from this experience, and I wear it with pride. Okay, thank you for your question. Next one's from Rute from Brazil. Hi, Rute. Good to see a fellow Brazilian in here. So thanks for the lecture. I would like to ask what are the basic general requirements to serve as a volunteer at the UN? Can you do it without previous work experience? Uh, yes, there are uh, internships and UNP positions available. You would have to look at specific terms of reference to, to look at exactly what are the, the qualifications. Uh, you're, you're joining us from Brazil. I see that there is an internship open in Sao Paulo, uh, but I'm not sure what exactly is the, is the, are the requirements. So we will have to look into specific term of reference for that. Um, I would just say that we won't have interns or volunteers working in uh, border situations, for example, in Macaraima, because this is more this is more tense environment, and the, uh, it's better for if you are if you it's if it's your first experience, it's better to work on office, not on on, on the field. Um, next is Maria Teresa from Spain. Thank you for the talk. How do you think we could find durable solutions for refugee crisis with political and ethnic reasons behind them, such as the situation of refugees in Myanmar? Ah, oh, that's a difficult question. Um, I'm, I haven't worked with, with refugees from Myanmar, but I know that our current head of office in Boa Vista has just arrived in Boa Vista back from Bangladesh. So, so we are, uh, we are, uh, having his experience from that situation on here. Okay, durable solution. There are usually three kinds of durable solutions. There is voluntary repatriation when it's safe to go back to the country and they do it voluntarily. There are um, resettlement programs when other countries uh, say that they are willing to receive refugees from from, from another country. So for example, let's say um, Brazil would join a while back a resettlement program from, uh, for refugees from Syria. So there were some refugees in Jordan who were recognized as refugees in Jordan. And, Bra and Brazil decided that it could receive a few refugees from uh, Syrian refugees from that region. And they were resettled from Jordan to Brazil. That's one example. Uh, but this happens a lot, particularly there's a lot of resettlement programs to the United States. Uh, and, um, uh, but, but there is also from, for Italy, for Rwanda, I see Rwanda has been very active in resettlement programs as well. Uh, and third solution is integration to the local society. So instead of, for example, going back to their country of origin, or resettling to a third country, they decide to stay in the country where they have asked for asylum and they integrate into their community. Uh, so this, I believe it's already the case for many Venezuelans who, who are arriving in Brazil, who are finding jobs, who are rebuilding their lives here and have decided to not go back. They tell me, some of them tell me, some of them tell that they wish to go back in the future when the situation of the country uh, reestablishes itself. Some of them say they will never return and they will be part of the Brazilian society and some are even applying for nationality. There's still a long way to go for nationality, but some of them are applying. Uh, in, in case of Brazil, there's also a, a fourth durable solution, which is the interiorization program, which is resettlement within the, the same country. Brazil is a big country is as big as continental uh, US. So 
uh, one, one of the generals who works for Operation Welcome, Welcome once told me, if every city in Brazil received four Venezuelans, we would never feel a, uh, a displacement crisis. And that's what we are trying to do with endurization, sending them from Boa Vista to places where they can uh, integrate better, uh, look for more jobs. Uh, so, so we have resettlements from the state of Roraima to the state of Sao Paulo to the state of Mato Grosso do Sul, from my hometown in, in Brasilia. Uh, about Myanmar refugees, especially in Bangladesh, uh, who have to look into the free third, uh, free first uh, durable solutions. Anwaro An from Bangladesh. Uh, no, wait. Is this our no? I didn't ask. I didn't answer this yet. Did you face any challenges while working in Brazil with Venezuelan refugees' safety and needs? Well, many. <laughs> um, first of all, there uh, there are many needs related to health. Some of them have requested asylum because of the uh, health system because of the health system in Venezuela has collapsed. Some of them have arrived here because the education system has, has collapsed in Venezuela. So they are looking, so they're coming here looking for the education opportunity for their children. So they are looking for schools, some looking for universities. Um, and of course, Roraima is a small state in the north of Brazil. And that's why uh, the interiorization program ex exists so that um, the crisis is less is, is uh, less felt here as well. To avoid that the, the health and education systems in in Roraima collapse, um, and this is just to give uh, one example. There are of course people with disabilities, LGBT uh, refugees. They are they are fleeing from violence from sometimes their their community, sometimes their uh, own family. Uh, you, because sometimes we think of refugees as always fleeing the state, but it's not always the case. Sometimes they are fleeing, fleeing their own families and they cannot report the police because the police system has collapsed. So we, I have received various uh, asylum applications that were based on, on uh, violence against women, for example, domestic violence, women fleeing their own husbands. Uh, and there are many uh, needs and safeties on, on regards to those to those populations. Oh, indigenous refugees. I didn't even mention indigenous refugees. And we're in the middle of a pandemic. And of course, indigenous, because of the history of colonization in South America, we are very afraid of, of endemic and pandemic diseases. That's another safety concern for them as well. Oh, sorry, now I see the correct question. 14, do you face any? Okay, I think I think I, I answered this. It's mostly the same question. Um, Danielle from the United States. Do you read a lot of international relations? Which works would you recommend? Oh boy, um, I do read a lot because this was my, my, graduate, uh, my graduate degree. And, and my MA was in, in peace and conflict studies. I don't want to recommend something because I think it would be too political. Uh, let's see if I can, can give you a recommendation on some refugee issues. Oh, Jim Loescher, I will type his name. If you look for Gil Loescher, he's a, a ref, he's an academic on on refugee issues. He died earlier this this year, um, and he wrote a lot about durable solutions for refugees, especially. Of course, of course, <laughs> of course, um, he wrote he wrote a lot about. Uh, refugee issues and, and refugees that did not reach durable solutions in five years. Uh, Lisa is, is, is showing me the book. 
uh, Chasing the Flame, One Mind's Fight to Save the World by Samantha Power. I wrote a review recently about this book. It is about a Brazilian, uh, a Brazilian UN diplomat. He started his career working for your CR, and he's very much an inspiration for me and for most of, of us Brazilians who work in the UN. Um, so, so here's a big recommendation. Thank you, Lisa, for reminding me of this one. Of course, how could I forget this one? Um, okay. Um, what is your opinion about the refugees who have deceived in traffic? Okay, uh, Naduki from Sri Lanka. Thank you for your question. Um, so this, this is a case in which uh, people might have been deceived or trafficked, um, maybe promised a job or promised some opportunity in a university. And when they arrive at the country of destination, these, uh, they find that it's not, uh, 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 it's not an opportunity, but sometimes they are doing forced labor. Uh, I have deal with some issues like that. Sometimes people receive some opportunity for, for a job. When they arrive here, they aren't paid properly, they aren't housed properly, they are, in other words, in a situation of forced labor. In this case, a person arrived as a migrant, but because of the conditions that they have arrived, they might become refugees. So this one situation that we sometimes refer as uh, referation sur place. It's a French word that means in place. Um, so it might have been the case that you arrive willingly to a country, but once you arrive there, you cannot go back because you fear for your life for coming back because you have, uh, for example, been a whistleblower against a trafficking scheme, a trafficking ring, or sometimes the, the situation in your country, the con your country has collapsed uh, Why you were in a different country. So this is, this is called refugee surplus. Um, well, my opinion is that we have to be very careful with those situations for the, the safety of, our, of our, the people we serve and for our own safety as well. Um, and we, of course, we, we uh, information, I say this every day, every, every week at least, information saves lives. Uh, and at the border, I sometimes will give lectures about, uh, about uh, the, the danger of trafficking in persons. Uh, so sometimes I'll give lectures saying, do you arrive, do you receive, did you receive an offer for a job? That's great. Do you know who this person is? Have you, have you met him or her before? Have you met him or her through the internet? Uh, what, uh, do, you, do you feel that you can go meet this person uh, and know who he is or who she is? And that's, that's a very important thing that we have to look into, especially in crisis like this. Um, Maria Teresa, wow, you're welcome, Maria. Coronavirus. Thank you, Nora, from the United Arab Emirates. What are the effects of the coronavirus regarding refugee aid? Uh, we have, uh, we are we're trying to, to uh, first of all, make information campaigns for all refugees here. We are, we are translating all our campaigns for the Venezuelan indigenous languages, which is a very, is a very challenging, uh, uh, it's a challenge, very challenging job because those are languages that did not exist prior, priorly in Brazil. So we have to find what our translations, translators, Enepa translations, which are which are those uh, which are two indigenous languages that, uh, that now exist in Brazil and did not exist before. Um, we are very grateful for uh, private companies that have uh, that have donated uh, alcohol and spray and in gel 
for to for us to give away in our shelters and in our registration and documentation centers. So just since it's being record, so to the record, thank you very much to the uh, Boticario group, which is uh, one of the biggest uh, gr uh, groups for perfumes and colognes in Brazil that have decided to go give a big donation on this regard. Um, and well, it's also, it has affected our capacities of delivering our work, of uh, doing documentation because we cannot have the, group, the documentation center packed full. We have to have a limited number of people who, who we can um, uh, serve per day. Um, uh, what else? Well, the border is closed, of course. Um, but the important thing here is that uh, we have two principles that we have to obey while thinking about coronavirus and refugees. So the first one is do no harm. That's a very important principle for, for humanitarian responses anywhere. Do no harm, do not harm the people you are supposed to be serving. Uh, and that's why I'm always wearing masks. I have my UNHCR mask right here. Uh, uh, we always, we're always looking a lot of, gel, uh, a lot of alcohol and gel and, and alcohol and spray. Uh, but the second principle is stay and deliver. Even if the situation gets tense, even, even if it gets worse, we stay and we deliver. We do not abandon people in need. Uh, just a quick announcement. We only have around five minutes left, so maybe one or two questions more. Okay. Um... I've been I've been asked uh, what is what I'm currently reading. I'm reading No War No Peace by Roger McGinty. It is a book about situations in which a war has not been declared, but there isn't peace either. And I think that this applies very well to the Venezuelan situation. There's not a, a war that there's been declared there, but then clearly you cannot say that Venezuela is a place that is at peace. Brazil and UNHCR recognizes there is a great, uh, an acute and generalized violation of human rights situation that's happening there. Um, what is my source? Antonella, thanks Antonella for your question. What is your source of strength to move forward and continue with your amazing job? Thank you for calling my job amazing. I love that. Well, um, one source of inspiration is just the, the people I, I see and their will to leave, and their will to resist, and their will to, to rebuild their lives. I've been following some of our cases for a while now. I see the look on their faces when they finally get a job, when they finally get reunited with their family, then finally get a driver's license. Uh, if you think it's difficult to get a driver's license, think when you, when you are in a country you don't know the language and you and you were a driver in your own country but you cannot provide the documents to prove so um, think of every problem you you ever had but but think that you're in a place that you don't know how it works you don't know the language and and, and you don't know uh how you're gonna how you're gonna survive the next day, and and to see them striving and to see them uh, just the, the look in their faces when they finally get a, a a place to shelter when they when they meet their friends and family again, uh, reunite with them when they get a, when they get employed even if it's underemployed because I see a lot of potential a lot of potentials with them. A lot of potential uh, with all all of the refugee community, but sometimes they just cannot prove their professional experience enough to to assume the same position they had before. Uh, so many of them are underemployed and happily so, uh, and that's and, and and that's just what inspires me to to continue working here. 